Well, last night was night two of the Democratic National Convention, and it featured hatred of actual wealth creation. A bunch of people got super rich off the taxpayer dime and then their subsequent fame and fortune. A bunch of lies about what a wonderful blended family Doug Emhoff has created and all the rest. If you need all the updates in real time, I recommend Election Wire Live every night during the DNC, 7.45 p.m. Central. That will be tonight. Obviously, when Tim Walls, the new vice presidential pick who is straight from the asylum, actually makes his big entrance and his big speech. Okay, so let us lead off today with a simple fact. The Democratic Party has an addiction to taxpayer Nepo babies. Their belief is that no one in the private sector actually creates wealth or creates jobs. All innovation is a lie. The best people on earth are people who live off the taxpayer dime their entire political lives, and then maybe later they get a little rich or very, very rich or buy like three houses like the Obamas off of their fame and fortune from having lived off the tax paradigm their entire life. But those are the most praiseworthy people. Actual wealth creation, actual innovation, these are very bad things. They're in fact terrible things. And what we actually need is an overclass of special people who've been living off the tax paradigm since their youth and those people who've never created a job, never created a business, never innovated a damn single thing, those people need to make all the rules of the road for everyone else. I know that we're supposed to just obscure this reality, this sick reality, with a heaping helping of joy. That was the DNC last night. The DNC was hatred of wealth creation, love for taxpayer Nepo babies, a radical agenda, and a large heaping spoonful of modern family joy. That's what the DNC was last night. So let us begin with the actual economic policies that will be pursued by Kamala Harris were she to be president of the United States. I know we're supposed to ignore all of that because, of course, she doesn't have an agenda. She's just happiness and joy embodied. She's the actual emotion joy from inside out. She actually is not a human. She's just a meme, a smiling, happy meme with coconuts in the background or something. But it turns out that if she gets her way, she'll be president of the United States. And then she will pursue a bunch of horrifically terrible economic policies that will sink the economy of the United States, make your life markedly worse. How do we know this? Well, it turns out she's the incumbent vice president of the United States. I know we're supposed to believe that she's the non-incumbent president of the United States, that actually the incumbent is Donald Trump or something. She's the incumbent vice president of the United States. According to Bloomberg, U.S. job growth in the year through March was likely far less robust than initially estimated which risks fueling concerns the Federal Reserve is falling further behind the curve to lower interest rates. So you have to understand the game that's being played here. For the entirety of this year, the federal government has been radically overestimating the number of jobs created under the Biden administration so that he can go around bragging about jobs that he didn't create. Okay, that's, that, that revision is likely to be in the range of at least 600,000 jobs they say exist that do not exist in the Biden economy. Now, why is that coming out right now? Because the goal is to jog the Federal Reserve to lower the interest rates and thus to blow more money into the economy, recapitulating inflation. And to do that off the basis of weak job growth. So that is the game. The game is you hide the job failures until now. Then you let that news out of the bag just early enough that the Federal Reserve can lower the interest rate and then artificially boost spending in the economy. But here's the reality. The bottom line is you were lied to. We were all lied to about the amounts of job growth that were created under the Biden administration. J.P. Morgan Chase and company forecasters see a decline of about 360,000 jobs. Goldman Sachs indicates it could be as large as 1 million. 1 million. A downward revision to employment of more than 500,000 would be the largest in 15 years and suggests the labor market has been cooling for longer and perhaps more so than originally thought. Why? Look at that. It turns out that all the lies the media were telling you for full on three and a half years about the booming economy and how it was just you being crazy. That's why you felt the economy wasn't going that great. No, actually, it turns out you were right all along and all the experts, as per our usual, were lying. They kept telling you the economy was booming. Everything was fine. And now they're telling you, whoopsie doodle, here is the thing. Anyone with a basic understanding of economics can see that the economy is not in amazing shape right now. I've been telling you for years to diversify your portfolio with precious metals. If you'd listened to me before, you'd be in better shape now. So now might be a good time to consider diversification with my friends over at Birch Gold. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert your IRA or 401k into a precious metals IRA. It's a smart way to protect your hard-earned savings from the impending economic disaster. But hey, if protecting your financial future isn't enough motivation, how about this fun thing? Back by popular demand. Now through the end of the month, you can get your very own 24-karat gold-plated truth bomb on qualifying purchases. It's a little reminder of the truth bombs we here at Daily Wire deliver every day, and it's the smart decision you made. 
to invest in gold. Here's what you need to do. Text Ben to 989898. You'll get a free info kit and learn how you can own gold in a tax-sheltered IRA account. Let's all put our financial parachutes on before the economy takes a nosedive. Do not wait for the crash to hit. Text Ben to 989898 right now. Claim your eligibility. Qualifying purchases made before August 31st can get a golden truth bomb to serve as a reminder of the great decision you made to protect your savings with gold. That's Ben to 989898. So what exactly are the policies that Kamala Harris are going to, what is her administration going to push? Well, we now know, apparently, Semaphore is reporting that she has endorsed the tax policies that were put forward in the last budget proposal by Joe Biden. What are those tax policies? Those tax policies include a 28% corporate tax. Understand that's insane. Every tax on a corporation ends up being passed down to its employees. If you tax the corporation, the Daily Wire, at 28%, That means our profit margin largely disappears. That means we have to fire people or we have to pay people less. It's that simple. Or we have to increase our prices in order to make up for the amount of tax that we are now paying to the federal government. Corporate taxes are double taxation because you are taxing income, you are taxing wages, you are taxing pretty much everything, and then you're taxing the corporation at the top level as well. So 28% corporate tax. They also want a 44.6% capital gains tax which is psychotic. That is, you sell a stock and half the money immediately goes to the federal government. Now, here's the most psychotic thing that they want, according to, again, the budget proposal put forward by Joe Biden and now endorsed by Kamala Harris. A 25% tax on unrealized capital gains. That's insane. Let me explain what that means. An unrealized gains corporate tax or capital gains tax. What that means is that if you have a house and your house has accrued in value, since the time that you bought it. Let's say you bought it last year, it was 500 grand. Now it is 600 grand. The federal government wishes to tax you $25,000 for the increase in the value of your property, even though you haven't sold it. That's what it means. If you're a business, you're a private business, and let's say that you're privately held, you've never gone to market, you've never sold your actual stake in the company. So let's say that you own a company and you started it, say, 10 years ago, and now that company is worth a billion dollars but it's never actually been sold for a billion dollars. It's quote unquote worth a billion dollars. Now, let's be realistic about this. Daily Wire, we're a privately held company. That means that we have not gone to market. We're not publicly traded, nothing like that. We can't even borrow against our stock because we're a privately held corporation and the actual material assets of the company are not borrowable. You can't borrow against those material assets of the company in the same way. There's nothing to actually seize, for example. There's nothing to foreclose upon because we don't actually own a giant physical property, for example. Okay, but let's say that we're a billion-dollar company for the sake of argument. We're more than that, but let's say we're a billion-dollar company for the sake of argument. Okay, if we're a billion-dollar company, that means the federal government would come in and levy a tax on us for not selling the company of $250 million dollars. The annual gross revenue of our company last year was $220 million. Okay, that's crazy. It bankrupts half the companies in existence. It's insane. It's patently crazy. Okay, why? Why are these people making these policies? The answer is that they are making these policies because they have no actual relationship to the real world economy in which human beings live. They have never created a job. They have never innovated. They've never built a business. They've never done a damned thing outside of take taxpayer money to boss people around. That is all they do all day long. That is true at every level of the top echelon of the Democratic Party. Barack Obama has never held a real job ever his entire life. He was a community organizer and then he went directly into taxpayer funded politics. None of those things are real jobs. Michelle Obama, worked at a private law firm for five minutes. Then she got a cush gig at the University of Chicago because her husband was in politics. And now she gallivants around being famous, wealthy, and well-loved because her husband was president of the United States. Chuck Schumer has been in politics since 1862. He has never held a job in the private sphere. Nancy Pelosi's husband was very rich, but she has never run a business. She has been in politics since before Socrates was killed. None of these people have ever created a damned thing, ever, 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 none. And when they say government creates jobs, I want to go back to a clip that we played yesterday. It's a clip of Kamala Harris. The only question she's been asked on the campaign trail. And by the way, we are now at, let's count them. Yep, yep, yep. We got to update it. Day 32 of no serious interviews for the Democratic presidential nominee. Zero interviews, zero serious questions. But the one question that she was kind of asked about how she would pay for her policies. Like, this is a thing that typically, if you're in business, you have to answer. How do you pay for the thing you want to do? You have to go borrow. 
That creates significant tailwinds. That can, you have to go borrow. That means that you have significant drag on your company, for example. Or maybe you have to do it out of cash flow, which means that you have to triage, decide where the cash goes and where it doesn't go. That's how you would deal with an additional cost if you ran a business. Kamala Harris has never run a business. She's never run a popsicle stand. Kamala Harris has been on the taxpayer dole since she left law school. And half of those taxpayer-funded jobs were created specifically for her because she was sleeping with Willie Brown in her early career. That's just a reality. It's not sexist. It's just reality. I'm sorry. Those were her life decisions, not mine. So I get to talk about them since she's the one who wants to be president of the United States. That's the way this works. That's not sexist. It's reality. Willie Brown himself has said so. She, of course, obscures it. That happens to be the case. Okay, so I want to play a clip from yesterday. Here is a clip in which she explains how she's going to pay for these proposals. You unveiled your some economic policies last week. Yeah. Can you explain how you're going to pay for those? And can you give us a sense of what other policies you want to unveil going forward? Sure. Well, I mean, you just look at it in terms of what we are talking about, for example, around children and the child tax credit and extending the EITC. That is, it's at $6,000 for the first year of a child's life. The return on that investment in terms of what that will do and what it will pay for will be tremendous. We've seen it when we did it the first year of our administration, reduce, we reduced child poverty by over 50%. So that's a lot of the work. And then what we're doing in terms of the tax credits, we know that there's a great return on that investment. When we increase home ownership in America, what that means in terms of increasing the tax base, not to mention property tax base, what that does to fund schools, again, return on investment. I think it's a mistake for any person who talks about public policy to not critically evaluate how you measure the return on investment. That would be a great question. How do you measure? How do you measure return on investment? Okay, she keeps saying return on investment. Now, if I run a business, I can tell my return on investment because I know how many dollars are going out and how many dollars are coming in. If you're a politician, your return on investment is not in dollars and cents. If you are a politician, your return on investment is how many votes you receive. And so the easiest public policy ever is to take money that has been earned by someone else and to give it to people who will vote for you for receiving free public benefits. That is the actual return on investment she's talking about. Don't give me this crap about the return on investment is reducing child poverty. Okay, throwing checks at people does not reduce child poverty in any serious way absent the extreme short term. Because it turns out that if you don't change the trajectory of income earning in a family, cutting somebody a check doesn't actually solve the problem for more than the next five minutes. To actually solve long lasting poverty, you need free enterprise, free markets, entrepreneurship, innovation, job creation. Those are the things you actually need. Okay, but that, all that exists in the absence of government interventionism. She has never run a business, so she doesn't have to answer in terms of business. She just hijacks business terms like return on investment to mean I pay off my political constituents and then the return on investment to me is votes. The reason that this is so galling is because the hatred for wealth creation in the Democratic Party, the true hatred, and it, it feels like hypocrisy, but it's not. It's worse than hypocrisy. Okay, the, the hatred for wealth creation in the private sector in the Democratic Party is matched only by the insanity of the fact that all the people who hate private sector wealth creation are perfectly happy to own a lake house like Bernie Sanders or three houses like the Obama family or to be rich as Croesus like Chuck Schumer. Like all of these people are loaded. They didn't get loaded by creating things. They got loaded by redistributing money from other people who earned it. They got loaded by seizing control of the levers of distribution. That is how they got rich. And then they turn around and blame the people who actually create the wealth. Understand that that's part of what underlies their hatred for Donald Trump. They hate that Donald Trump was a businessman for decades before he became president of the United States. None of these people know how to run a business. They don't know how to start a business. But here's the thing. For those of us who do, we know that saving time is a key. If you're a finance professional looking for a better way to maximize productivity and cut wasteful spending, Ramp could be for you. Ramp is a corporate card and spend management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your own pocket. With Ramp, you can issue cards to every employee with limits and restrictions. You can also stop wasting time at the end of every month by automating your expense reporting. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time, so you actually don't have to. You'll never have to chase down a receipt again. Your employee 
employees will no longer spend hours submitting expense reports. The time you save every month on employee expenses will allow you to close your books eight times faster. Ramp is super easy to use. Get started in less than 15 minutes, whether you have five employees or 5,000. Get 250 bucks when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash Shapiro. That's spelled R-A-M-P dot com slash Shapiro. Again, that's ramp.com slash Shapiro. Cards issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members of FDIC. Terms and conditions do apply. Again, that's ramp.com slash Shapiro. You can't afford to lose time or money when you're running a business. You're not the federal government. Head on over to ramp.com slash Shapiro. Become more efficient today. Ramp.com slash Shapiro. All of these people became rich after being politicians. Donald Trump became rich before being a politician. It's, it's, it's a particularly sick rip on exactly how economics is supposed to work. You're supposed to delegate the power to handle the world's most robust economy, the driver of global growth for legitimately a century and a half on planet Earth. You're going to hand that over to people like, for example, Bernie Sanders, a career leech on the taxpayer, a man so useless he was once thrown out of a commune for failing to do work. A man who was a deadbeat dad while living on a commune in Vermont and preaching about socialism while making trash educational home videos. And that dude is now running economic policy for the Democratic Party. I, I point all this out because when you are forced at the point of media gun to say joy, joy, happy joy over all of this, you ought to remember these people will be in control of your life, of your pocketbook, of your kitchen table. And they've been running things for the past 12 of 16 years. Okay, Donald Trump was a four-year interregnum. 12 of the last 16 years have been run by Democrats. Has it been going amazing? Have you been enjoying it? But remember, it's all about the evils of the wealth creators. Those people are bad. The best people are the people who never create new wealth. The best people are the people who waste your wealth on their political friends. So here is Bernie Sanders. Again, the fact that this person is respected in democratic circles after honeymooning in the USSR, recommending the power of bread lines, suggesting the full-scale nationalization of the American healthcare system and never creating a damned thing while owning a lake house is astonishing how this person is considered a man of the people. If he is a man of the people, that says something about the stupidity of the people. Here is Bernie Sanders saying his agenda isn't radical. Trump's is. That's weird since you're a socialist. Let us be very clear. This is not a radical agenda. But let me tell you what a radical agenda is. And that is Trump's Project 2025. This is absurd. It's absurd. By the way, let me point out the radical agenda beyond just the economics very quickly. Chuck Schumer has already pledged to kill the filibuster on behalf of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It ain't going to stop there. If they got control of the presidency, the Senate and the House, you are looking at the most radical change in the structure of American government since the 1960s. Easily. And in terms of the actual functioning of the federal government, the most radical change to the American structure of government since the progressive era in the early 1900s. Maybe since the Civil War. Okay, the reason that I say that is because if they get rid of the filibuster, here are the following things that they are certainly going to do. They're going to immediately attempt to impose term limits on the Supreme Court of the United States. We know that because Chuck Schumer already endorsed it. He already said he wants to shift the balance of power on the Supreme Court. So they're going to hijack the Supreme Court because it is an obstacle to the things they want to do. That's number one. They get rid of the filibuster. It's not just for the voting rights kind of stuff. It is also for the Supreme Court. Two, the voting rights kind of stuff. What exactly is in the Voting Rights Act and all of the other nonsense, misnamed voting rights laws the Democrats want to pass? Full-scale national ballot harvesting. Democrats going door to door to find people who they can grab ballots from. Two, no voter ID, getting rid of state voter ID across the nation. Three, same day ballot access. You walk up, you register, you vote. You want to talk about the possibility of massive voter fraud? That's what this is. Plus, pre-clearance for every red district in America by a left-wing administrative court. Okay, they want to do that with filibuster. They also want to very obviously mass amnesty at least 10 to 15 million illegal immigrants in the country right now. So all of the talk about how no, don't worry. Illegal immigration, that's never going to be a, ma a matter of voting or demography or anything like that. Well, then why are Democrats so hellfire bent on actually amnestying 10 to 15 million people? They've already said they're going to do this, by the way. This is their comprehensive immigration reform plan, a pathway to citizenship, by which they mean 
everybody here illegally get citizenship in the hopes that they will all vote Democrat. They have already stated, too, that they wish, if they kill the filibuster, to add Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico as states. That is four, count them, four Democratic senators. That means a permanent Democratic majority in the Senate of the United States without a filibuster. That, the, that's, that's just what they want to do on the structural side. That's not even getting to the policy side. That's not even getting to their economic plans, which involve mass taxation and massive spending and blowing out the national debt and confiscatory regimes where they remove wealth from people and the possibility of gaining wealth. That's not even talking about their DEI attempts to redistribute wealth by group status and intersectional victimhood. That's not even getting to their attempts to enshrine trans politics and vast, wide-scale abortion into federal law. Those are the things they will get if there's a trifecta. And they say them out loud and then they pretend that is not a radical agenda. It's an absurdity. It's the most radical agenda in the history of the United States. And they are out there promoting it and suggesting that the real bad guys are the The real radical agenda is saying no to any of that. That's the real radical agenda is when you say no. But again, what does this come down to? It comes down to the idea that people who have been utterly useless their entire lives ought to govern all of us. Every one of us, they ought to govern every aspect of our life. They ought to rejigger completely the relationship between the individual and the government and the people who are really to blame. The people who are really the Nepo babies are the people who are wealthy in the country. All these morons and their Nepo baby comments. Well, if you were born rich, that's affirmative action. Well, if you were born with a two parent family, that's also in their terms, affirmative action. The only thing, according to them, that's not affirmative action is, you know, actual affirmative action, discriminatory government policy. You might be able to understand these idiocies and you know, all of their attendant implications better if you went to Grand Canyon University, a private Christian university in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. GCU believes we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. GCU believes in equal opportunity and that the American dream starts with a purpose. GCU equips you to serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come. By honoring your career calling, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. Whether you're pursuing a bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree, GCU's online, on-campus, and hybrid learning environments are designed to help you achieve your unique academic, personal, and professional goals. With over 330 academic programs as of December 2023, GCU meets you where you are and provides a path to help you fulfill your dreams. The pursuit to serve others, that's yours. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private Christian Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. That's gcu.edu. Now again, James Lindsay, a professor who studies sort of left-wing theory, he has coined what he terms the iron law of woke projection. The idea that the left is constantly accusing the right of everything it itself is. Okay, that is certainly true for the left when it comes to wealth creation. And it's certainly true when it comes to things like Nepo babies. Okay, so the left is constantly harping on the idea that if you grew up rich, then this means that there is something that is innately evil about you. That if you receive the benefit of growing up middle class or above in the United States, that you are effectively an affirmative action child. This is a case that Michelle Obama tried to make last night. She understands that most of us will never be afforded the grace of failing forward. We will never benefit from the affirmative action of generational wealth. If, if we bankrupt a business, if we bankrupt a business or choke in a crisis, we don't get a second, third, or fourth chance. If things don't go our way, we don't have the luxury of whining or cheating others to get further ahead, no. We don't get to change the rules so we always win. If we see a mountain in front of us, we don't expect there to be an escalator waiting to take us to the top. The iron law of woke projection. Iron law of woke projection. Okay, every single thing that she says there, we don't get a second or third or, or fourth chance to fail up. That's Kamala Harris's entire career. Her entire career is failing up. She was a crappy DA and she was made into a crappy attorney general by the skin of her teeth in a super blue state. She was made into a crappy senator and then she failed and she was made a crappy vice president and then she also failed and she's now made into a crappy presidential nominee and presumably will be a crappy president. She has done nothing but fail up. The idea that the Obamas have never been given a second, third, fourth chance they get endless chances because they're in politics. There ain't no ROI on what they do. Nobody is expecting them to meet a bottom line. They've never gone bankrupt because there's one group of people who can't go bankrupt. Politicians, not possible. They are living off the taxpayer dime. 
The government cannot actually go bankrupt. It just prints additional dollars. Your policies fail. Well, you can always confiscate dollars from people who actually made those dollars. That's the beauty of being a politician. That's the beauty of being reliant on the taxpayer. You can never go bankrupt. Affirmative action of generational wealth. You can blow that. You know how many people have blown generational wealth? I know many of them. It happens all the time. The one, the one parental scheme that can never be blown is the one where the government is your daddy or mommy. It'll just keep cutting those checks for literally ever. And again, this idea that you never get a second, third, fourth chance from the federal government under a democratic scheme is a lie. It's ridiculous. Of course, that's not true. The true Nepo babies here are people like Michelle Obama's kids, whose actual money was created on the back of fame and fortune created by the taxpayer, by the taxpayer. Michelle Obama would not be on that stage absent being married to Barack Obama, and he would not have been president absent being a career politico in Chicago and part of the machine. Now, listening to these people jabber on about the affirmative action of generational wealth, here is the deal. That's not affirmative action. Affirmative action is where the legal, the, the legal structures are designed to give you extra points versus other people. That's what affirmative action is. It is not affirmative action when people are born in different situations. Okay, we're all born in different situations. Some are born tall, some are born short, some are born smart, some are born stupid, some are born rich, and some are born poor. That is the reality of life. The question is, what structure allows for the greatest levels of mobility? And the answer there has always been and will always be freedom. Not somebody like Michelle Obama or Barack Obama or Bernie Sanders sitting atop a hill and picking who ought to get ahead and who ought to fall behind, putting burdens on the back of the people who build in favor of the people who can't or won't build. Okay, that is not exactly how everybody gets ahead. That's not the way that you create a structure and an incentive system where people can actually create innovation. The sort of government interventionism, the socialistic ideas pushed by the Democratic Party have been tried for generations. Hell, for millennia, they've been tried. They fail everywhere. The only thing that has ever progressed humanity in terms of material well-being is free markets. That is it. Free markets, capitalism, innovation, property rights. Those are the only things. The reality is that any economic system that attempts to remove risk from the system also removes innovation from the system. Now, speaking of risk, now there's certain things in life that just make things a little bit more fun. Betting with Bet Online can be a lot of fun. Beyond traditional sports, Bet Online gives you the option to bet on political events, like the outcome of the presidential election. Political betting allows you to wager on real world events outside the realm of sports. Or let's say you're a diehard sports fan, Bet Online makes sports betting more accessible and convenient than ever before. With just a few clicks, you can place bets on your favorite teams or events from the comfort of your own home. Bet Online prides themselves on their higher than average betting limits of up to 25 grand. You can increase your wagering amounts by contacting their player services desk by phone or email. So while you're watching your favorite team, or the news on upcoming elections, why not spice things up a little bit with a friendly wager at Bet Online? Head on over to betonline.ag to place your bets today. Use promo code Ben for a 50% sign up bonus of up to 250 bucks. That's betonline.ag. Use promo code Ben. Bet Online, the options are endless. You want to spice things up this weekend with a little bit of sports betting? Well, now would be the time. Go check them out. Betonline.ag. Use promo code Ben for a 50% sign up bonus of up to $250. This is why it's so, it's so sickening when you hear Michelle Obama you know, talking about. I love when she says, we, we won't rig the rules. Or, I mean, you literally just ousted the presidential nominee and you're trying to rig all the rules of the Supreme Court. You're trying to get rid of the filibuster, add states. Sure, sure, we believe you. you you're, you're big respecters of institutions. My favorite part here is when Michelle Obama says that her parents were suspicious of folks who, quote, took more than they needed. She owns three houses, three. Is that more than she needs? I feel like given her contribution to the world at large, the answer there would be yes, Again, she should be able to charge whatever the market will bear for her dumb speeches about DEI. And if somebody's stupid enough to pay her $750,000 for an hour of speaking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, so be it. That is the market. However, that market would not exist absent the fact that taxpayers subsidized her. The reason she is famous is because she was the first lady. She's never been elected to a damned thing ever. Here we go. You see, my mom in her steady, quiet way, lived out that striving sense of hope every single day of her life. She believed that all children, all, all people have value, that anyone can succeed if given the opportunity. You don't believe she that. She and my father she doesn't believe that. didn't aspire to be wealthy. In fact, they were suspicious of folks who took more than they needed. 
they understood that it wasn't enough for their kids to thrive if everyone else around us was drowning. Okay, that, that is such sick and perverse language. It really is. Take more than they needed. In a free market, you don't take. You offer services, goods, and products at a price other people are willing to pay. The only people who take in a society like ours are the people in government who literally point a gun at people and then take their money. It's people like Michelle Obama. It's people like Bernie Sanders. It's people like Barack Obama. And it is people like Kamala Harris who point the government gun at people that they don't like and then they steal their money and use it to their own political benefit. Those are the takers and we all know it suspicious of people who took more than they needed. Again, how much do the Obamas need? Do they need that Netflix deal, something they really need? Do they really need it? Now, again, they didn't take it. So it's okay. They get to have it. What I object to is that they got it off the back of destroying the comedy of the American political system. They did it off the back of polarizing us economically and racially. They did it off the back of a taxpayer-funded subsidy lifelong for the Obama family. I object to that. The hatred of private wealth from these people, it just it just ripples off of them. It's insane. It really is. Here's Barack Obama doing the same thing. He, he's, of course, very angry at Donald Trump. He says, Donald Trump rode down his golden escalator nine years ago. One thing I noticed about Donald Trump and his golden escalator, he owns it. That's the thing I noticed, as opposed to Barack Obama, who got famous by taking your money and using it for random political purposes that allowed him to become richer and more powerful. Here's a 78-year-old billionaire who has not stopped whining about his problems since he rode down his golden escalator nine years ago. Whining? I noticed you here, dude. I noticed you here, my dude. They did try it out last night. One person who actually was the beneficiary of what Michelle Obama might call affirmative action wealth. That'd be J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois who had to be lowered into the arena by crane. And uh, J.B. Pritzker is the scion of the Pritzker family who owns the Hyatt Hotels, which means that his family is worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. He himself, in order to become governor of Illinois, dropped hundreds of millions of his own dollars on that. Okay, The only time he's allowed to mention his wealth is when he's suggesting that he's richer than Donald Trump. But it's a little awkward because if he had actually been a self-made billionaire, he would not be welcome in the halls of the Democratic Party. He would be one of those selfish, terrible people who would have to justify his existence by calling for higher tax rates. Here is J.B. Pritzker saying awkward things. Donald Trump thinks that we should trust him on the economy because he claims to be very rich. But take it from an actual billionaire. See, it's funny because he because he's an actual billionaire, which is OK now. So all the same people who are saying billionaires are bad and ought to be burned. Trump is rich in only one thing stupidity. Amazing. Amazing. And it just shows you that the arguments don't have to be consistent. They don't have to be in any way thoroughgoing. They don't have to be a worldview. It's just a bunch of petty insults and stupidity thrown against the wall. But underlying it is an actual ideology, the ideology of Bernie and Michelle and Barack and Kamala. And that ideology is that the private sector is bad and that those who seize power point a gun at the private sector take that money and use it for their own political benefit, those people are good. Those are the good people. Not only that, they're never to blame. That's the beauty. And Michelle Obama said, you know, we never get a second chance. If we go bankrupt, we never get a second chance. The beauty, again, of being terrible in the political sphere is there's always a second chance. Always. In fact, Democrats right now are running as the non-incumbents. Chuck Schumer, for example, another lifelong ward of the state, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, he says, he's ripping on Trump. He says, do you want to live under Trump's carnage again? Well, one thing I noticed is that right now, Joe Biden is still the president of the United States. Yeah, I know he's dead, but it doesn't matter. He's still technically the president of the United States. He's still technically breathing. I noticed that 12 out of the last 16 years, Democrats have been in charge. And here he is ripping on Donald Trump. This November, we can choose a brighter, a fairer, a freer future, or we can relive the dark night of Trump's American carnage. Only one candidate will move America forward, Kamala Harris. Ah. Chuck Schumer. They're not the incumbent. They're the incumbents. It's their fault that they never go bankrupt. That's the beauty of being a politician. You never go bankrupt. You never do. It's just wonderful. Hey, Michelle Obama is doing the same thing. Kamala will make America great. She's had her shot. And you know what? She she blew it. She was the deciding vote on the Inflation Reduction Act. You know what that didn't do? Solve inflation. But we're supposed to pretend that Kamala is a fresh face. 
We're supposed to pretend that she's had no record whatsoever. She is just a cipher arrived from Mars in order to grant the magical wishes of the American people. Here's Michelle Obama pretending that nobody knows who Kamala is, that Kamala has no record. Of the two major candidates in this race, only Kamala Harris truly understands the unseen labor and unwavering commitment that has always made America great. The unseen labor and unwavering commitment? Well, yes, Kamala Harris, woman of the people. Sure. What, what from, her, from her secure perch as a teenager in Montreal? The, the daughter of two Berkeley PhDs? Mm-hmm, sure. Meanwhile, Barack Obama says, we don't need more, four more years of chaos. Again, the, they're, they're campaigning as though Kamala Harris is, is actually the out-of-power party, and Donald Trump is the incumbent. That's how they're campaigning here. We do not need four more years of bluster and bumbling and chaos. We have seen that movie before, and we all know that the sequel is usually worse. He was the star of that movie, and then the sequel was worse. It was Joe Biden. Bluster and chaos and bumbling, that's his entire administration. And then his vice president became president, and we got that plus death. Well done. But again, if you... I keep saying it over and over. It's right in front of your face, American people. Americans, it's right in front of your face. If you wish for this tripe, if you wish for this truly cynical and despicable worldview, which is that you should be governed by a bunch of elitists from the coasts who have never, ever run a business, who have never signed a paycheck, who have never done anything of value for anyone around them, except for pretending their own virtue by stealing other people's money and redistributing it for their own political benefit. If that appeals to you because they say, because they say such nice words about, about things like fairness and justice and equality and joy, if that appeals to you, I don't tell you, you deserve what you get. I'm just going to keep citing Mencken until the election. Democracy is the theory that the American people get to decide and then they get what they deserve, good and hard. In just one second, We'll get to the Democratic Party lying about their own anti-Semitism, just lying in the most despicable and disgusting way. First, if you've already been to miracist.com and purchased your tickets for opening weekend, September 13th, we thank you. We are also getting messages from people saying their local theater is not yet showing Am I Racist. Here's how to fix that. Every single ticket sold right now in theaters already carrying the movie helps push it into more theaters across the country because the theater chains see that there's demand. Matt Walsh and the same group of white guys who absolutely destroyed leftist gender theory and what it's a woman, they're back. This time they're taking on the weird world of DEI. What he's uncovered is both laugh out loud funny and downright enraging. The response to the movie has been phenomenal so far. We can't afford to slow down. If you've got Am I Racist playing at a theater near you, head to miracist.com, buy your advanced tickets today. That's how we get this movie into as many theaters across America as possible. Meanwhile, the Democrats continue to lie about pretty much everything, including the anti-Semitism within their own party. So yesterday, according to Yair Rosenberg, who's a staff writer for The Atlantic, Jewish events at the Democratic National Convention have been held at undisclosed locations under heavy security to protect them. Okay, that's how bad the anti-Semitism is at the DNC. At the RNC, they were chanting, bring them home about the hostages. They were chanting in solidarity for Israel. Orthodox Jews were plentiful everywhere at the RNC. At the DNC, Jewish events have to be held behind closed doors at undisclosed locations because of the level of anti-Semitism inside the Democratic Party. Well, yesterday, protesters, pro-Hamas protesters, showed up to yell at Jews. So there is an organization, it is called Aguda Israel in, in Hebrew, Agudat Israel in English. The Aguda is not a Zionist organization. It is not. The Aguda is a religious Orthodox organization that focuses specifically on things like school choice, for example, or setting up Eruvs in local communities. That's what the Aguda is. Okay, so it has nothing to do with Israel. They have no Israel policy. They do not comment on Israel. It is not their thing, but they do happen to be Jews. So, of course, the pro-Hamasniks showed up to yell at the Jews because that's what it's always about. It ain't about Israel. It's about the Jews, of course. Here's what that looked like. They just found Jews and yelled at them. That's what's going on at the DNC. I mean, okay, just going to point out that if these members of the Aguda were in Israel, for example, they would probably be identified most with the Haredi community, which is not serving in the military. That is, that is what Aguda is. Aguda is, is sort of like the very right wing of the Orthodox community in the United States. 
So they're in favor of there being a state of Israel, but they're not necessarily in favor of there being a secular state of Israel. It's very controversial. It doesn't matter. They're Jews. And so they're going to be yelled at by the actual pro Hamasniks at the DNC. That's what's happening at the DNC. Meanwhile, the protesters were outside burning American flags in the street. I mean, honestly, they should have just been welcomed inside to burn American flags since that's pretty much the Democratic agenda at this point. They burned an American flag and a Jewish flag or a combination of uh, the Stars and Stripes and the Megan David. Uh, and that's when we saw a, cl- a conflict right away because someone came in and stopped them from burning the flag. And then we saw some pushing and shoving. It looked like it was going to turn into a fight. But I should mention that this, this demonstration, uh, this group calls themselves Behind Enemy Lines. You can see a lot of the familiar clothes. Uh, they made a very deliberate confrontation with the police here. Super classy people. So Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, who was widely expected to be the vice presidential pick, and then it turns out he was Uden, so that couldn't happen. The Democratic Party will not accept a Jew as VP under Kamala Harris, because that, of course, might suggest that they don't love enough the pro-Hamas contingent. Josh Shapiro was asked by Josh Krashauer if he agreed with President Biden that the anti-Israel protesters, quote, have a point. And here is what he said, quote, look, I haven't heard specifically what they've said. I'm not trying to duck your question. I'll address it. I think the protesters absolutely have a right to have their voices be heard. Whatever the rules of the road are, the mayor of Chicago, I assume he sets that. They got to follow their rules, but their voices should be heard. They should be encouraged to exercise their First Amendment rights. Whether I agree with them or not is beside the point. Well, no, that actually is the point. But you're a coward because the Jews at the top level of the Democratic Party don't care about Israel. They don't care about Judaism. They care much more about fealty to their party. End of story. It's that simple. It's that simple. That's true of Josh Shapiro, too. Captain Zionist over here. I don't I don't have any opinion on what they're saying. Don't you, though? Don't you? If those were white supremacists outside applying their First Amendment rights, would you have something to say about the cause for which they are burning the American flag? Or would you go silent on it, just like Josh Shapiro did? So yesterday, the Democrats tried to trot out two of the least credible sources on fighting anti-Semitism in America. Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, who has presided over the pro-Iran tilt of the Democratic Party, the complete consolidation of the squad within the Democratic hierarchy, and making excuses for every anti-Semite under the sun, Chuck Schumer is what he's been doing, and Doug Emhoff, who's as Jewish as a ham sandwich. It's the most pathetic crap. I'm sorry, Doug Emhoff talking about Judaism is like me talking about traditional Catholicism as a traditional Catholic. Like, no, the answer is no. That dude has no adherence to Judaism. He has no relationship with Judaism. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. For years, we've played videos of Doug Emhoff trying to pretend he understands what a Jewish holiday is. He has no clue. He told the story of Purim, And his story of Purim was completely wrong. Then he told the story of Hanukkah and it was completely wrong. He just doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And his daughter fundraises for the UNRWA, which is a Hamas front group. And his wife is presiding over an anti-Semitic Democratic Party. So these are not exactly sources that I rely upon to tell me about anti-Semitism. And yet this is what they did. They trotted out Chuck Schumer to talk about how he's the highest ranking Jewish. What you want to talk about a hypocrite? Chuck Schumer is just gross. As the highest ranking Jewish elected official in American history, I want my grandkids and all grandkids to never, never face discrimination because of who they are. But Donald Trump, this is a guy who peddles anti-Semitic stereotypes. What a trash person Chuck Schumer is. Donald Trump is the most pro-Israel, pro-Jewish president in American history. And Chuck Schumer is up there suggesting that he, a person who covers for the squad, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, AOC, that he is standing up against anti-Semitism. You got to be kidding me. Any Jew who falls for this crap, you're a moron. Seriously. And then Doug Emhoff gets up. Can I know it's supposed to be like a charming introduction to Kamala Harris because her 'er ne'er-do-well, straight from the sitcom, kind of cloddish husband is up there talking about how much he's subservient to Kamala and all the rest of this. And oh man, isn't it just so great that I'm that I'm here and I quit my job just to follow her around on the road? Political call, Doug Emhoff, the daddy in chief or the dad in chief today. Wrong. But we're supposed to believe that he's Captain Judaism now because obviously when, when it comes to Jewishness, when it comes to like true abiding feelings, of Ju- like I have a dog in this fight, okay? I'm a little Jewish, wear the funny hat and everything. Okay, when it comes to Judaism, I can tell how Jewish you are by how often you say that your Judaism is reconfirmed by going to church on Easter Sunday with your wife and your pro-Hamas daughter. Pretty sure that's not Torah Judaism or Judaism in any way. But, you know, she does make a mean brisket. You sad sacks can't condemn anti-Semitism within your own party because Kamala Harris makes a brisket and Doug Emhoff goes to church on Easter Sunday. 
Like, give me a break. Give me a break. Listen, it's a free country. He can do what he wants. But don't pretend you're speaking for Jews and Judaism when you say stupid shit like this. Kamala has connected me more deeply to my faith, even though it's not the same as hers. She comes to synagogue with me for high holiday services, and I go to church with her for Easter. Yeah, just like just like Judaism says. I get Judaism to enjoy her mom's chili relleno recipe every Christmas, and she makes a mean brisket for Passover. It, it brings me right back to my grandmother's apartment in Brooklyn. You know, the one with the plastic-covered couches. <laughs> but Kamala has fought against anti-Semitism and all forms of hate her whole career. No, she hasn't. She won't even fight Hamas. Now. She's the one who encouraged me, a second gentleman, to take up that fight, which is so personal to me. No, it isn't. Your own daughter supports the pro-Hamas UNRWA. You belong to blended families. Know that they can be a little complicated. But as soon as our kids started calling her Mamala, I knew we'd be okay. Oh, well, isn't that charming? Because it's just like, oh, man, wow, what, what, a, what a wonderful... If you buy this trash, you have a low IQ. Don't know what else to say. Okay, they're also out there talking about the joy, the joy, the joy, the joy, the joy. Okay, by the way, some of the joy is that it has been confirmed that 25 babies have been killed by Planned Parenthood at the DNC. So that, that sounds pretty joyful, except for the dead babies. The dead ba- Not so joyful, the dead babies, but so much joy, so much joy. So, for example, they let off this thing. It, it's, it's, it's all a spoonful of sugar makes the strychnine go down. So they, they, they let off with the Women's Caucus singing the national anthem. By singing, I'm being very, very generous. This is actually like a cat being run over by a tractor trailer. They don't know the words. Oh my God. That makes perfect sense. I, I, I can't torture you more with this. I can't. Even I don't have the heart for that. We need to play that at Gitmo for the detainees. They don't know the words. They don't know the music. That makes perfect sense, after all. They're, they're on stolen land in Chicago, as we've been told. Then, for the roll call vote, they had this very, very long roll call vote where everybody pledged their fealty for Kamala Harris, despite the fact she's not won a single primary vote. It doesn't matter. So uh, Lil John showed up, uh, who I believe is still singing Turn Down for what, right? That's like his only song ever. Is where he just shouts, turn down for what a lot? And yeah, it's something about shots on a Saturday night, I don't know, and uh, and then turn down for what? So why are they going to turn down? They won't turn down. There will be no turning of the down. Here is Lil John, last relevant about the time that I was in high school. Yeah! Oh, good Lord. He pronounced her name wrong. They are trying so hard to make fetch happen. They're trying so hard. Good God. And then they're just waving this giant bobblehead of Tim Walls. We'll get to Tim Walls in a second. That dude's a freaking weirdo. What a weird dude Tim Walls is, seriously. Michelle Obama, of course, she was there to talk about the magic in the air. So much magic. So much magic. So much propaganda. Something wonderfully magical is in the air. Isn't so it? magical. Oh. Yeah. No, that's just. It's just y'all sniffing the Democratic Party's farts. Arena, but it's spreading all across this country. We love a familiar feeling that's been buried too deep for far too long. You know what I'm talking about. It's the contagious power of hope. Oh, the contagious power of hope. Yeah, it's like COVID. It's like the COVID of hope. Over here, wear your mask. Hope is getting everywhere. By the way, what she's actually talking about is that the power of hope was lost because Joe Biden was president, which is hilarious. Again, he spoke last night or the night before. They shuffled him off to his deathbed in California. And then they're like, 
don't you all feel so much better that that we got rid of that old bastard? And then there, it was so funny. Barack Obama comes out. He's like, he's like my brother who I murdered. There's like Michael Corleone speaking about Fredo. You know, here's Barack Obama saying, yes, she can. Uh, it's so worn out. It's so worn out. Don't be stupid. Vote on the policy. Don't vote on this tripe. We need a president who actually cares about the millions of people yeah. all across this country who wake up every single day to do the essential, often thankless work, to care for our sick, to clean our streets, to deliver our packages. We need a president who will stand up for their right. All their wages, for better wages went down. And work in well, Barack Obama was president. And Kamala will be that president. Well, Joe Biden was president. Again, she's not the incumbent or anything. Yes, she can. Yes, she can. <laughs> he's a, he's such a pair. Uh, and then he gets the chant. He waits for the chant. Uh, uh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. It's like watching a Maoist rally. Honest to God, it's it's so scripted. It's so ridiculous. It's so mannered. It's so speaking of. Ridiculous, mannered, pathetic. Tim Walls. I don't know where they got this guy, and I don't know what kind of coke he's snorting backstage. But here was his entry last night. He showed up at the very beginning of the night to say some dumb crap. And uh, and he came in like Chris Farley in 1996 on a David Letterman appearance. He's going to pick up the producers and toss them in the trash can. Except Chris Farley was acting. Tim Walls is supposedly genuine when he walks in like this. Governor Tim Walls. For those who can't see, he's like, big hands. Yes, he's jumping up and down. Oh, yeah, huge hands. Look, oh, oh, my God. The enthusiasms. So many enthusiasms. Oh. So excited. Ah, oh, the giant smile. Like a baby tasting his first bite of ice cream. He does have a baby brain. So there is that. Also, he's a liar. So remember that time that he suggested that um, in vitro fertilization was the reason that he'd been able, he and his wife had been able to get pregnant. And it turns out that was completely a lie. Here he was lying about it. Today's IVF day. Thank God from IVF, my wife and I have two beautiful children. He thinks he needs to dictate that. And I've been saying this, the golden rule that makes small towns work so we're not at each other's throats all the time in a little town is mind your own damn business. Mind your own damn business. God, these people. Okay, I, honestly, I do words for a living. I'm at a loss for words. The amount of lying, the amount of hypocrisy, the amount of projection from these, mind your own damn business. You're aborting babies in the parking lot. You're taking kids away from their parents if the parents refuse to have them trans. Mind your own damn, you're talking about confiscating wealth that has not yet been realized. Mind your own damn business. And this habitual liar. But again, remember, it's all papered off. It's all papered over with joy. So much joy. And that's what Doug Emhoff was there for. Not just the fake Judaism. He was there for the fake joy. So, Listen to this magical story of a romance that bloomed when Kamala Harris was 49 years old and had to run for the sun. But don't worry. It was, it, true, true romance happening here. True romance. Here we go. And by the end of the meeting, the now happy client offered to set me up on a blind date, <laughs> which is how I ended up with Kamala Harris's phone number. <laughs> now, for generations... People have debated when to call the person you're being set up with. And never in history has anyone suggested 8.30 a.m. <laughs> and yet, that's when I dialed. I got Kamala's voicemail and I just started rambling. Hey, it's Doug. I'm on my way to an early meeting. Again, it's Doug. He's the dog from Up. Okay, well, folks, if this is your kind of thing, I suppose you can vote for it. Just be warned, it comes with a bit of an agenda, as we've been discussing. You might want to remember that when you vote for the President of the United States. All righty. In just one second, we'll get to the other side of the aisle. Donald Trump. He did have like an all-time great moment with the media yesterday. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us. 
Republicans or Nazis. You cannot separate yourselves from the bad white people. Growing up, I never thought much about race. It never really seemed to matter that much, at least not to me. Am I racist? I would really appreciate it if you love. I'm trying to learn. I'm on this journey. I'm going to sort this out. I need to go deeper undercover. They gonna say I'm racist. Joining us now is Matt, certified DEI expert. Here's my certification. And what you're doing is you're stretching out of your whiteness. This is more for you in this field. Is America inherently racist? The word inherent is challenging there. I want to rename the George Washington Monument to the George Floyd Monument. America is racist to its bones. The so inherently. Yeah, this country is a piece of white folks, white trash, white supremacy, white woman, white boy. Is there a black person around here? What's a black person right here? Does he not exist? Say I'm racist. Hi, Robin. Hi. What's your name? I'm Matt. I just had to ask who you are because you have to be careful. <laughs> Never be too careful. They gonna say you racist. Buy your tickets now in theaters September 13th. Rated PG-13.